Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of American Rambler. I'm your host, Colin Woodward. Thank you for listening to the podcast. On today's show, I have Professor Ed O'Donnell. He teaches at Holy Cross in Worcester. We are both Massachusetts guys. He's from Gloucester originally, um, but has been at Holy Cross for a while. He did his undergrad there, and it was good to finally talk to Ed I had wanted him to be on the podcast a long time ago and just couldn't make the time since last summer, the podcasts were stacking up. We're going to talk a little bit about this, but um, had a big backlog and it was tough getting through it. So a couple guests that I wanted to talk to toward the end of last year, I didn't, I did not talk to until recently, Ruth Hawkins being another one, but it was good to talk with Ed. I, you know, he's not plugging anything and I didn't necessarily uh, want him to talk about just the podcast. I wanted to get into his backstory as I like to do, but uh, he is a grad of Columbia University, so he's got some interesting stories about New York giving tours there. He is the author of a number of books going back to 2002, 1001 Things Everyone Should Know About Irish American History. His more recent one is Henry George and the Crisis of Inequality, Progress and Poverty in Gilded Age America. That is from Columbia University Press. So he's working on a couple big things right now. He is on sabbatical, as I said, so he has a nice uh, bit of time off before he is teaching again. And I don't know, with teachers, if this year was just as bad as last year, and know last year was really rough, maybe this year a little better, but still pretty exhausting. I know I'm looking forward to summer vacation and our kids being home and sleeping in a little bit. And I am not teaching, but uh, it is just a lot of things going on now, not just with COVID, but the profession generally uh, taking some real hits in terms of just student enrollments and job security and all that. But Ed has weathered the storm. He is a focused guy and uh, has been getting his work done and teaching and doing the podcast, though he did stop it. 199 episodes with in the past lane but you can go back and check those out Uh, i did enjoy the podcast i do miss it but i I totally understand his time constraints and wanting to focus on the writing which is kind of where i'm at now although since the johnny cash book is done i have more times i'm like oh maybe do some some more podcasts there's people i want to talk to so trying to Keep that under control, my podcast addiction. Not as bad as it used to be. It was really bad uh, for a while. But, uh, you know, it is a fun thing to do, and it's great to be able to talk to people like Ed and would not get that chance otherwise. But some days, you, just the thought of editing a, a podcast is, is the last thing you want to do, especially when you got family and other things going on. So you podcasters that are out there, uh, more power to you. If you were thinking about doing it, just know, uh, you if you do make it past the the first six episodes, which are the hardest ones to do, if you get past that number six, it, it will take a lot of your time, and just wrestling the technology itself is an issue. But uh, the the editing, I would say, is the most challenging aspect of podcasting. All right, well, I don't want to go on for too long. Uh, just want to get to my talk with. Ed O'Donnell. How long do you have? Do you have an hour? Yeah, I've, I've got. Uh, I'm on sabbatical, so you know. I mean, oh, I got other nice. things to do, but I, I don't have the normal, uh, you know, pile of papers to staring at me. Okay, good. So you've been all semester, or did it just start? Oh, just beginning. Yep. So. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Yeah, I just um, wanted to just kind of talk to because I know you 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 did a podcast for a while and uh, been following you on Twitter for a while. So just kind of wanted to talk with you about that and just, just kind of your journey. I know you're, you're at Holy cross. Um, You've been there about 20 years now, right? Yeah. Hard to believe 21. Yeah. Are you from there originally? I'm from uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts. So North of Boston and uh, now, so that Gloucester is 40 miles North of Boston. That's where I grew up. Um, I went to college at Holy Cross, which is in Worcester, 40 miles west of Boston. Um, then went off to grad school, got my first job at City University in New York, 
at the Hunter College campus, which was great, but um, it's kind of hard to raise a family there. So <laughs> had my eye on, uh, you know, uh, any and all good uh, New-, New England liberal arts colleges. And lo and behold, the job opens up at the right moment at, uh, at Holy Cross. Okay. Was it hard to raise kids because of the, the expense mostly or for other reasons? Well, it was in the expense. So it was yeah. uh, basically, you know, you don't have to have a degree in economics. The, in the 18, excuse me, in the 1990s. So I started at Hunter in 95. It was the lowest paying uh, large university system in the country in the most expensive city in the country. Um, yeah. And we had four kids. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, wow. all of those numbers were were they were in collision. So, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get too personal necessarily, but so you started, you started family before you were in grad school or was it during? No. So I, I, uh, we got married in 88. I started grad school in the same year in 88. And then two years later, number one came along. So we were sort of, uh, young, young and naive and, and, uh, you know, Four, ba- four babies in five years. Uh, oh my God. Dissertation. Uh, started yeah. a walking tour business while I was in New York um, in order to, you know, pay some of those bills. So, yeah. Um, now, Hunter, I, I don't know exactly where that is. Like, that is in Manhattan. Yeah, it's Upper East Side. Upper East Side. Okay. Yeah. Well, and you were getting there. So, would you say 88, 89? Well, so I, I, grad school for me was at Columbia, so Upper West Side, um, starting in 1988. And then I finished seven years later in 95 and, you know, managed to get a great job at a great university um, in the same city. So we didn't have to move. We had to move from Manhattan to Brooklyn, but um, Hunter was a great fit. And I would have, I think we would have stayed there forever. We love New York, but um, yeah, cost was just so stupendous that I had to work like a hundred hours a week to like barely break even. So. Oh my God. Well, and when you first got to New York, like what was sort of the situation politically and economic? Cause I mean, obviously it kind of in the mid nineties, New York came back. I mean, I know there are people that are nostalgic for like old Times square and everything. But like, <laughs> yeah, there are always there, those people. <laughs> was it scary when you got there or was it just like, yeah, it's New York. I'm cool. It was, it was pretty gritty. My wife grew yeah. up uh, in Manhattan. So I had, you know, and her family was still there. So I had uh, sort of okay. locals and, and people who could kind of explain it. So I'd been to New York a lot in the 80s. Okay. Uh, but in 88, you know, the what we now think of as the, the crack epidemic, I know those that's sort of a, a bit of a loaded term because of what yeah. we now know more about it. But the way it was framed was, you know, crack was running rampant in the city and people were being, you know, murdered for $5. And so there was, it was definitely a pretty dangerous place you definitely feared um, being mugged at at night. Uh, probably, you know, my fear was probably disproportionate to reality. But still, um, by 1990, I might I have to I would say by 1991, the murder rate in New York, the number of murders was over 2,000, mm-hmm. and so it was a the the danger was real. It was blown out of proportion in lots of ways. So, um, and then from 91 on. Uh, that's when the crime rate, you know, the murder rate, the violent crime rate began to decline. So yeah, we, we, uh, we got there in, in time to experience this, the more chaotic and also the kind of rundown part of the city, you know, the subway had made a big comeback by then, but there were other parts where you could go into Bryant park and right in the smack middle of the city, uh, and, you know, see half the grass was washed away. Some of the benches were broken, you know, but lots of vast sections of central park were, and, great disarray um down the lower east side which is like you know the cool hip place to be these days there was basically every other business was shuttered um it was really sleepy you know no if you said to somebody let meet me on ludlow street most people would have no idea what you're talking about whereas today everybody knows ludlow street because it's got all the bars and and such so um it, it was fascinating in that regard too to see kind of a the tail end of that new york's downward spiral from the late 60s into the uh, late eighties. And then also to witness, you know, the upside of things getting better, um, which is that, you know, the city became safer and everything else, but also to really to start to see pretty clearly the, uh, d- the deleterious effects of gentrification and the just unrelenting gentrification that, you know, has, has really never stopped. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Okay. Uh, sorry. I got your, your chronology a little messed up, but yeah, you're finishing up at Columbia around 90 in 95. So this is kind of like the height of the Giuliani period, maybe, or right. 
you know, and, you know, and, and yeah. signs that, um, you know, you know, public private partnerships, privatization of lots of things, you know, the central park conservancy, I would have to check the year, but at one point, you know, closes uh, or ter- turns the park over to Disney. I think it might've been Pocahontas. One of, one of the big Disney movies of that era was screened on the great lawn. And, you know, and a lot of people, uh, said, wait a minute, we're letting Disney, we're, you know, basically renting out Central Park to Disney to screen this movie. And um, a lot of people said, oh, do, you know, it's not a big deal, but you can now see that the kind of privatization of everything, um, th- that was certainly a sign of it. And then, uh, you know, the cleaning up of Times Square was great because it really was pretty grungy, pretty dangerous, pretty ugly. Um, but <laughs> the the method by which it was cleaned up was to you know to turn it over to 100% over to uh developers so right well and then disney's kind of become like a shorthand a metaphor for times square and new york city generally like the disneyfication of times square and absolutely all these corporations coming in and i i don't know how much you've read into but i'm i'm probably guessing like people saying they're from the real new york is as old as new york itself like there's dudes in like 1800 or like yeah i remember in 1790 there were <laughs> yeah. trees in brooklyn you could climb up you know it was like before there was even a real city it's like it seems good i mean i i can't really i i haven't never lived in new york but like it seems like a lot of it is sort of relative and there's some there's some historical amnesia too with like people pining for the days when yeah it was just uh porn in Times Square and you're getting mugged and like, well, do we want to really go back yeah. to that? You know, I don't know. But you you were really in I mean you were given tours all the time. Yeah, I started a walking tour business with um um uh, it really didn't start out as a quote unquote business. It was just a walking tour enterprise to make some money with another fellow graduate student. And um, you know, it was just by total luck that we started it. We didn't know, nobody knew that suddenly New York could get safer and travel to New York would just, you know, quintuple in the next, you know, decade. And that uh, something like a walking tour enterprise, walking tour business could really, you know, just there was no end in sight in terms of how much opportunity there was to offer walking tours to the general public or walk, offer them through organizations like the Tenement Museum or uh, the Municipal Arts Society. Yeah, so we started Big Onion Walking Tours in the fall of 91. And uh, the guy that I started it with is still running it. And it's still one of the largest, if not the largest and most successful walking tour business in America. Wow. Um, and you were doing this every day? At Whenever we could. So, yeah. was, you know, and then on a weekend, it was un- not unheard of that I would do I think the most was most I could physically do in terms of in time was I could do seven. I could do a Friday night Brooklyn Bridge tour, and then I could do three tours on Saturday and three tours on Sunday. Um, yeah, so I would do group, you know, like a group tour in the morning. Then I'd catch the one o'clock show up tour, which was one that would just say, "Hey, it's um, Wall Street and the Financial District." You know, show up here at one o'clock, and you never knew how many people you'd get. But after a while, you start to get a lot because you know the the idea of doing walking tours catches on. And then also the reputation of our, of our little enterprise uh, caught on. And then I might, you know, when I'm done with that, I might catch a, you know, have another scheduled group at four o'clock and lead them around the Lower East Side, you know, on a, on a eating, on a multi-ethnic eating tour, Um, go home, uh, (laughs) throw the kids in the tub, hang with my wife for a little bit and get up at, you know, the first thing on Sunday morning, do it all over again. Uh, Wow. Um, and so this is lower Manhattan and the boroughs or were you, where were you, you focused on Manhattan or were you doing other parts of the city? Well, the, the original, you know, centerpiece was the lower East side. So the, really the kind of the ethnic tours of, of New York. So a multi-ethnic tour. And then, um, my, uh, the guy that I started with was Jewish and had studied a lot of Jewish history. So he began offering the Jewish lower East side tour and eventually hit upon the brilliant idea of having a Christmas day, Jewish Lower East Side tour. <laughs> okay. But within a couple of years, we had like 500 people showing up. It was, you know, and cause it was such a, not such a cool idea. So we had to have more guides. Um, and then since my field of one of my fields of expertise is Irish American history, I began offering the Irish New York tour on the Lower East Side. Uh, we'd offer Chinatown tours. Um, my, my, my tiny little uh, footnote claim to fame is that Natalie Portman, when she was 12 years old and going by her original birth name, uh, came on my Chinatown tour um, on uh, Chinese New Year. How did you know that? You know, somewhere like 1990, 
five, uh, six or seven, something like that. So, okay. How did, how did you know that she was on the tour? Well, it was, it was funny. I was working at the museum of the city of New York, you know, for my, my fourth job. Um, and one of the women there said, Oh, my daughter, uh, who's 12 and is doing a, you know, ethnic heritage project for her class. She and her friend, uh, are kind of come on your, your walking tour. And her friend is, uh, going to become, uh, she's becoming, I think her first movie was just about to come out, um, is becoming a super duper uh, movie star. And her stage name is uh, Natalie Portman. And da 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 da. And anyway, so I, you know, I, I, uh, I remember seeing, you know, two 12 year old girls um, in the crowd there, but uh, never, I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't shake her hand or anything like that. That would have been, that would have been uh, somewhat strange unless they had come up to me and asked me extra questions. And yeah. then, um, and then years later I went back at the museum of the city of New York giving a talk. Um, and I saw that woman there and I said, can you just confirm the story? And she goes, yeah, yeah, you got it hundred percent right. That was Natalie Portman and my daughter, you know, 1996 or seven. Um, okay. and, uh, and you know, January of probably January of 96, I'm guessing. And ah, uh, so that's, that's cool. one of those fun footnotes you, you do meet. I don't, I think that's, there, there are probably some well-known people who have come on a walking tour with me back then that I just didn't recognize them. Um, you do, I met, you know, I bumped into Mayor Giuliani about 10 times because we would start a lot of our tours on the front steps of City Hall, which you cannot do now post 9-11. But back in the day, I'd just be standing there with a gathering crowd and Giuliani would get out of his black SUV or he'd come out of the City Hall and say hi to us and uh, get into his black SUV. So it was a, one of those little fun side sidebar, uh, uh, things. So you said you'd have as many as 500 people at a time. Well, that was, you know, the kind of an accident of success. You know, once that, sure. once that we established that tour, then placed every, everybody like Time Out New York, New York Times, everybody's sort of looking like alternate things to do on, on Christmas day. And, uh, so it got a lot of publicity. And so by the time it was 500 people, um, and I might be exaggerating slightly, but it's certainly hundreds. Yeah. Um, that Seth, the, the guy that I started with, he anticipated that. And so he was able to like, make sure he had four other guides there. And then, and, you know, and then as time goes by, this is all not quite pre-internet, but sort of early internet um, where we did, there was no way to have an app or to make reservations. and yeah. everything else. So slowly, but surely they've, um, they've figured it out, but it was kind of a fun accident of, uh, of success. I would have similar, I wouldn't have quite 500, but in the, if St. Patrick's Day fell near a weekend, you know, I'd run a bunch of Irish New York tours and I, that would be completely busted out. And I do it like a, and we, we also had an Ellis Island tour. So we would do a, a regular Ellis Island tour, but we would also do one that was themed. So, you know, my Jewish Ellis Island, you know, the focusing on the Jewish migration story or Irish Ellis Island. And those would get um, pretty substantial, you know, good, good sized crowds. So how, how would everyone pay if you have that many people? Were they like getting a ticket or? You stand or, there and you look like a drug dealer, as my dad said, uh, concerned for my, concerned for my well-being. Um, you just stand there and take cash. And, okay, uh, okay. you know, and if you get 40 people, you know, you have, you have 350 because it was nine, you know, seven bucks a tour, nine bucks, nine yeah. bucks a tour, I think was the, the going rate, sort of pegged it to the price of a movie. Okay. And, um, yeah, you'd end up with a, and, and then if you did like, you know, two walking tours, um, you know, you could end up with a pretty massive wad of cash, but I never got mugged. So I was very grateful. Uh, well, you had, you had a couple hundred witnesses, I guess, if uh, you did. Well, at the end of the tour though, I mean, it, you know, the, it would not be all that hard for somebody to figure out if I just follow this guy. For right. Sure. Yeah, that's true. You know, um, yeah. wait, wait till he's turned the corner. Um, so, but luckily none of that, you know, none of that happened. I mean, yeah. New York City, even at the height of New York city's, you know, uh, high crime rate, um, high rates of mugging and personal uh, violence and things. It still was a pretty, you're, you're statistically were not that, not in that, that much danger uh, relative to, you know, Cleveland or rel relative to lots of other places. So um, in, in a lot of ways it was more dangerous, but it wasn't that dangerous. Yeah. Well, you know, 10 million people live there. So all those numbers are, are relative. And I mean, it, you know, it was a national thing. I mean, I, I was going in an undergrad 93 and it was in Hartford, which is small, but I mean, it was a war zone. It was horrible. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in the, you know, most universities, most colleges like Trinity or um, not so much Holy Cross. Holy Cross is where, you know, in Worcester is always in sort of a secluded area, but yeah. so many big, I mean, when I went to visit the University of Chicago in 88, because that was the other school that I was choosing between Columbia. I mean, 
when we got to our hotel, the, you know, for accepted students weekend, I said, where can I go to get some beer and pizza? And he said, I'll call for it. And I said, no, no, I've just had a long plane flight. Let me go. And he goes, I can't let you walk out the door. Like wow. that whole area around the university of Chicago was had a, you know, incredibly high yeah. uh, rate of muggings and, and assaults and things. And that was true around the Columbia campus. You know, many campuses were sort of situated in these difficult, you know, left behind parts of cities. And now it's hard to recognize that because so much gentrification has taken place and sometimes good forms of it, you know, with a, with a university is actually a good partner uh, with the, with the city and doing, you know, doing a much more planned version of, of gentrification, trying not to kick people out of the neighborhood, but trying to make the neighborhood more safe and, you know, repair the parks and get the lighting restored and all of that. Yeah. I've, I've spent a lot of time in university of Chicago area and it's, it's great now. Um, it was great when I was there. It was like 2005, 2006. Um, but yeah, I mean, and looking back, I, cause New York was so scary to me. I mean, I'll, I'll give you credit, you know, for going there in the eighties, like mm. it, for me, it was, I, I, the first time I went there was, I was in high school and it was, I guess it was kind of starting to turn around a bit. Um, I know exactly when it was too, cause they, they got in Wade Boggs from the Red Sox, went to the Yankees, and this guy was like, all in our yeah. about it. We're getting off the bus. He's like, Wade Boggs is going to New York, baby. And like, oh, yeah, him. he's my favorite player. But yeah, um, hard, hard to hard to take back in the days where everything just seemed to be tilting in one direction only. And um seems like a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, so does your family kind of go back a ways in Massachusetts? I, I, I mean, O'Donnell, that's a very Irish name. Are they kind of entrenched in that Boston area or like what's your family history? Yeah. So both my, my father's family settled in the Worcester area. So his father came from County Mayo, Ireland in 1896. So, and there was already a pretty substantial Irish population in Worcester, in the other mill towns like Millbury, Clinton, um, arriving in the late 19th, early 20th century. And then my mother's side came a little bit earlier and settled in in and around Boston in West Roxbury. And and then my parents, of course, you know, um, so w- my mother grew up in Gardner, Massachusetts, which is north oh, of yeah. Worcester. And um, my father grew up in Worcester and they didn't meet, they met in New York City, you know, so they were grew up not, actually not that far from each other, but ended up both being in New York in the 50s. And that's where they met. Oh, interesting. Yeah. My mother's family is from the, the suburbs of Boston and my dad's from New York state mm-hmm. uh, and they met in Boston. Um, so obviously you, you're sort of, your, your research, do you think is kind of, were you focused on a bit because of your family history, like the Gilded Age? I know you've, you've written a lot about that. Was there, do you kind of like it because of your family connections or how did you get into that time period? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, that's a good question. I went to graduate school really kind of wide open. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I wrote in my grad school, you know, letter, but I didn't, I I don't, I must've pitched some plausible like focus because they tend not to, you know, they tend to sort of match you up with an established professor. You know, if you you express interest in colonial history, then that person gets to kind of say, yes, I'll take them or no, I won't. Um, Right. And that sort of thing. So I don't know what I said, but I, you know, got to New York and I was pretty freaked out by being in New York. It seemed so dangerous and so dysfunctional. And then two weeks later, I'm saying to myself, this is the most magical place in the world. It's amazing. And then, you know, a little bit later, I'm, you know, the expert on New York City because I'm leading walking tours and doing lots in in New York City history. So I think being in New York kind of pulled me into urban history and pulled me into history of immigration and labor history. And those three three things sort of emerged uh, as I went through my, my course of study. And then uh, when I came time to choose my dissertation topic, um, ended up sort of finding a topic that kind of fused all three of those things together. You know, the, the labor movement in the 1870s and 1880s in New York and a reformer named Henry George. And a part of that story is the Irish nationalist movement um, in the 1880s and how it connected with the American labor movement. So an interesting uh, journey. Yeah. Not exactly a straight line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's okay. Um, who did you work with at Columbia? So I, I've worked with anybody who would have me. So, um, I worked with, uh, with Eric Foner, uh, and I still occasionally see him at, uh, history conferences, you know, we, yeah. we all, we all want to be Eric Foner when we're 70 something years old and still brilliant and cranking out, uh, books. Uh, Ken Jackson, who is the great urban historian, um, another great influence on me. And he's also a guy who kind of, was one of the people that also led walking tours and was a real proponent of 
getting out and exploring the city. He used to lead a famous all night bike trip was sort of the culmination of his history of New York city class. And so, you know, they, there'd be, you know, 60 people out on bikes riding around the city all night long, you know, going to the Fulton fish market, going to, you know, the flower district, uh, all kinds of, you know, fascinating things. Um, and then Betsy Blackmar, who is a great expert on on many things, but she had just put out her book on history of Central Park, social history of Central Park. Um, who am I leaving out? Um, I mean, those are probably the three. Um, oh, and Jim Shenton. James Shenton uh, was one of the great gurus at at, um, at Columbia. And if you looked at, I mean, for for quite a long time, you could open a lot of books by people like Foner and, and, you know, other esteemed scholars and in the acknowledgements, it would be, and special thanks to James P. Shenton, who, you know, read the manuscript or who suggested this topic to me. He didn't publish much, but he was just one of these amazing teachers and a great advisor and guru to, you know, just several generations of young historians who, you know, kind of found their way. And, uh, you know, and he was also just a b- beloved guy. He'd say, come on, let's go out to lunch, you know, and, yeah. and really friendly, friendly um, uh, figure. So, and he also was the guy, he also gave walking tours and sort of kind of was the person that took me and, and the guy that I started our business with, took us under his wing and, sh- and had us, because he was getting older and he said, I don't want to do this walking tour for the, you know, for the 92nd Street Y, it's I'm too busy or I'm too tired. How about you guys do it? So he kind of handed passed the baton to us, which was, you know, pretty fortunate and pretty cool as far as we were concerned. So and we owe a lot of debt of gratitude uh, to people like that. Did you have a main advisor for the dissertation? Yeah. So who would be my, I would say Ken Jackson, I think was my main advisor. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because I mean, it could have gone, but, but uh, Alan Brinkley was also very influential. Um, you know, it was a pretty big, I guess all major departments are sort of a cast of all stars, but that department was, was pretty extraordinary. And also I have to say Columbia was an incredibly humane and sane department. Like everybody was, there were, you know, people had stresses and strains, but I would have, um, I was ever so grateful that I went there because it just seemed like a place that allowed you to become a historian as opposed to places that have much more hardcore you know, more like a military, more like the Marines where they break you and then make you. Um, yeah. I don't know if I would have, I don't know if I would have made it through that process um, just because I wasn't, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't, I was pretty naive and needed time to kind of grow into understanding what a historian was, understanding what history was, understanding, yeah. you know, how to begin to apply, um, you know, to figure out what I wanted to do and, and then to apply myself. Well, it sounds a little more collaborative there too, because at least in my program, like, it was pretty much you had one advisor. You'd maybe not see some of the people on your committee till the day of your defense. And I would maybe go to, to other professors occasionally for whatever advice, but like it was pretty much it was a one on one, if you want to call it that. I mean, my advisor was was gone a lot, um, but it sounds like you had more of a holistic like five people were really kind of advising you pretty well, or at least. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, I, one one was the designated advisor, but and it yeah. may have just been my personality where I just you know okay. I went and asked, I went and talked to people, and you know, and they were very receptive. I never felt brushed off. Yeah, um, I think people were genuinely interested in the projects that we were all doing. No, I mean, Foner, he he seems pretty approachable. I mean, mm-hmm. I had him on the podcast and stuff, so like that was amazing for me. I mean, mm-hmm. I met him once before, but it was like you know, obviously we know we know who he is and his all his awards and stuff, but like he was very cool. He, talked about Richard Hofstetter. I mean, uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, it sounds like you also had good training. I mean, doing all these tours and doing all this public speaking, like I bet by the time you were teaching or maybe you were doing that too and doing the tours, but I mean, that's, that sounds like really good practice. It was, it was, um, I mean, if you're looking, you know, a lot of grad students, have to work. So, you know, you get a job as a bartender, or you get a job doing, you know, catering or something like that. And that, you know, those pays the bills, but, you know, doing walking tours is a form of teaching. And it also, there was a certain a kind of a fascinating interplay between research and walking tours, because I would be looking, you know, my field was New York city history. So I'd be, you know, in the archives, reading the New York times from the 1880s, reading about strikes and inevitably stuff would start making it into my, into my walking tours. Cause I'd be able to figure out, Oh, this is where that strike or where that altercation took place. So this is where, you know, so it was, it was uh, fun in that regard to be able to kind of um, link the two, th- the two things together. 
And the other thing that was really gratifying, which was that even you know way back in the early '90s when we we didn't ever envision that it would be this full flown you know walk into our enterprise that it that it has become, uh, but the number of part of its calling card was always that virtually almost every person that you encounter at Big Onion Walking Tours as a guide is someone who's a historian, someone who is a someone in graduate school, either at Columbia or NYU or, you know, some other, you know, one of our friends was from Penn, but he was doing his final work in, in New York City. And so you're you're not in the hands of somebody who's read a few chapters of a couple of guidebooks. You're in the hands of somebody who's actually a historian. And so uh, that was the and to know now that there are literally, I mean, it'd be hard to guess, but um, I would say well over a hundred tenured PhD professors of of history out there that uh, had a at one point or another were plug, paying some bills by doing tours for Big Onion Walking Tours. So that's a kind of a cool wow. thing. Well, it's funny too because you're like, on, and then on the one hand, you're you're studying labor unions and socialism essentially, and then on the other hand, you're doing like the most capitalist thing possible. Yeah. <laughs> In, in all indeed, cash we, business. <laughs> all cash business and we had to be you know we had to be really entrepreneurial you know yeah and and you know realize that you know there are ways so we at one point we realized that we could um you know the the one way to get a bigger crowd we were getting lots of new yorkers a lot of great you know tri-state area people that were reading about it in new york new york magazine what have you but you know the, every year millions of tourists how do you get the people in the hotel who go to the concierge and say what should i do and, you know, walking tours were relatively small, almost invisible at that point. So how do you how do you get in their, you know, on their radar screen? Well, you take out a phone book and you write down the names of all the hotels and then you develop a mailing list and then you develop a fax list so you can back in the day. And so every Friday and then you, you know, you, you get a automated fax program. Uh, this is all really 90s um, technology. But every Friday we could send or Thursday night we could send to the, you know, f- 50 or 100 New York City hotels to the concierge desk, a fax that would just simply say, here are the three walking tours Big Onion's offering uh, this weekend with all the information. And so, you know, that's a lot of, you know, what we around here we would call pick and shovel work, you know, just like developing a mailing list and then, you know, getting it out there. Um, eventually, you know, you, you develop a website and, and all of that. But it was really a lot of... Um, a lot of work to to reach a larger crowd. You know, we at some point somebody said, you know, you should look into law firms. Law firms have, you know, you know, the big law firms in New York City bring in lots of summer associates and they spend lavishly on their uh, entertainment as they work them into the ground. They also take them on, you know, harbor cruises and bike tours. And so um, we hit that market pretty hard too. <laughs> Same thing, big figure out how you get a mailing list of all the big firms and then get in touch with the right person. And uh, next thing you know, you're 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 paying some bills. Yeah. And was it also kind of a process where you sort of had to build a persona, so to speak, like you're kind of entertaining them, I would guess a lot as well as giving them information was was that something you had to work on a little, almost like a, I don't want to say like a a nightclub act, but like (laughs) New York audiences can be rough. And mm, I don't know, how was that? I think, I think our personality was really limited in, in our cases, I would say, we didn't do any shtick. So it was all enthusiasm. So it was just enthusiasm and really, really good content. Like we could, you know, we, we could answer a very specific question, but we could also sort of set, you know, as historians, you know, somebody asks you a question about what, who knows what it might be that, you know, a murder that you're talking about that took place on this particular corner. Um, and then, you know, somebody asks you a question, you say, well, you know, to fully understand this, you know, this is what the state of the, the mob was in New York in the early seventies, you know, or what little Italy was beginning to look like and the changes that were taking place. So that kind of enthusiasm and depth of knowledge, I think was, the, was the big calling card. And also everybody kind of, you know, when we would get written up, it would always, one of the major features of the article would say, these are all, these are not out of work, uh, actors who've memorized some chapters of a, of a guidebook. These are historians or okay. budding historians doing research. And then in many cases, bringing their research into their uh, walking tours. So you're doing a more kind of like a national park ranger would do it maybe than like, I mean, you know how it is. You go on some of these tours sometimes in Charleston or New Orleans and it's like, does this guy really know what he's talking about? Yeah, like, <laughs> We never went down that route. And I think that, you know, the stuff, if you know what you're doing, yeah. sometimes that kind of shtick can be, I think, entertaining and, and make things interesting. But for us, it was just, you know, really 
I guess, transmitting our excitement for the city and helping people read the city and, you know, being able to say the simplest of things like always look up. Like when you stop at a corner, look up because there's something interesting in the pediment of the building or there's, you know, some some interesting features that you don't see in the hustle bustle of moving around Manhattan. But if you just stop and look up, then you start to you start to see a whole new world above, you know, above the second story. Uh, and you also start to notice little basic, you know, ABCs of architecture. Uh, or, you know, you might note it, begin to notice a building that looks like it's a marble classical style building, but it's actually a cast iron building. Uh, and there are different ways to to be able to tell that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you guys you knew your stuff. Um, just to go back a bit, you, you majored in history at Holy Cross. Were you really into American history and wanted to go on to grad school? Or was it you were kind of just interested in history generally and then focused down later? You know, well, I grew up in a yeah, I grew up in a family um, that was very into history. So my parents both were history majors, and we were also a large, you know, seven kids family. So we didn't, we never went to Disney. We went to a lot of, you know, regional historical areas, and would always pop into museums or historic sites, Paul Revere's house, and that sort of thing. Okay. And uh, we were also, you know, big a family a, a house that was full of you know, literally, literally thousands of books. I mean, we I could never begin to count them. So. Were they teachers, right. your parents? No. So my mom was, was a stay-at-home mom, um, uh, and my dad was a physician. So he went to Georgetown a million years ago as a, pre, a history pre-med. And then my brother went off to college uh, a few years before, four years before I did. And he, went, he became a history pre-med uh, and then went off to law, medical school. And so that was my plan. I was going to be a history pre-med um, and then you know become a doctor just like my father and my, and my brother. Um, but I got crushed by general chemistry. And so oh, yeah. once I picked myself up and dusted myself off, I realized I really like history and I've actually liked teaching. Like I liked, you know, I've always liked teaching swimming lessons as a lifeguard. I always like, so it was kind of an easy move in that direction. And then by then I'm ensconced in this, you know, lovely liberal arts college where you start to say, being a professor, you know, I could be a high school teacher. Certainly that sounds like a great career. But being a college professor just seems so cool. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah. kind of moved in that direction um, after you know after the crash and burn of uh, first year, and and it just worked out you know better than I could ever have asked for. Yeah, I I knew I had some friends at Trinity who were doing like the pre med track, and I I think it was the biology class that was really killing some of them, like mm-hmm. weeding people out like crazy. So had at least one friend who he's like, he became an English major. He was yeah. <laughs> in pre-med and became an English major. But um, I'm going to take a wild guess and say you're from a Catholic family. Oh yeah. Yep. Big, uh, yeah. Big, uh, well, Holy cross. I mean, you know, but um, seven kids. Yeah. And I teach a course called I, the Irish American experience. And so um, this year it seemed almost more so than normal, but this year, I mean, I, I kept every now and again, I'm trying to explain something to my students, like the, you know, McCarthyism and the cold war. I would invariably like refer to my mother or refer to my father, like, and, and refer to my family experience. And so it was, uh, right down to the very last day I was quoting, quoting or citing something that my mother, you know, had said to me that was sort of quintessentially, you know, conservative Irish Catholic, um, you know, statement of, from a, that particular time. Yeah. It's, it's its own thing. I mean, growing up there and, uh, yeah, you know, obviously you see movies and stuff where it's set in Boston and it's like super Catholic. I'm like, I know it's kind of a stereotype, but it's also really true. I mean, my, <laughs> yeah. I have a great uncle who was a priest and everything. So I grew up in, in all that. Um, but were there some people in your cohort at Columbia who we would know now, like other historians in grad school that maybe people would know? Yeah, like- I mean, Sven Beckert uh, was a year ahead of me or, you know, a l- slightly ahead of me, um, but he's the... He's a professor at, uh, and his uh, spouse, uh, Lisa McGurr, is also, they're both at Harvard and they're both highly, highly accomplished uh, historians. And Sven's real, you know, his major, what people mo- know him for now is his work in the history of capitalism, but also sort of being the, one of the pioneers in making that a big field these days. And so lots and lots of people who want to study the history of capitalism, you know, would give their right arm to study, not just at Harvard, but to study um, under him. Um, Lisa McGurr's written a lot about, you know, um, 20th century American history, Suburban Warriors was her uh, first book about women, um, uh, conservative women in the 50s and 60s, you know, kind of under the radar. But now we can see, looking back, you know, the rise of Reagan and and then playing a 
um, kind of an instrumental role. And I think her last book was on the history of prohibition. So those are those are two folks. Kevin Kenny was a um, I think he was yeah he was in my year. And Kevin um, is he's from Ireland and he's one of the leading figures of Irish and Irish American history. He was at Boston College for a while. I think he's at NYU uh, now. So um, yeah, I, I could. Um, let's see, uh, Adam Rothman, who's at uh, Georgetown, uh, another. Uh, Max, Max Page, who's at uh, UMass. Um, long list. I'm going to, if I, you know, this is like one of those things that like, you, you, you worry about, you know, you don't want to start naming names and leave um, leave certain people out. But certainly, a um, you know, a great cohort of folks that, um, that I was de- immediately connected to. And then there were people that were slightly ahead of me. And then also some folks that were, um, you know, a couple of years behind me, but, um, it's a, like I said, it was a great program. And I, I feel, you know, like if I had had every now and again, I think I might've, you know, what made me not choose Chicago? And I think Chicago would have chewed me up and spit me out. Oh yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know if I've ever talked to anyone who's gone there. Um, I, yeah, I don't know anything about their program. I mean, obviously it's, you know, it's a celebrated program at, at Chicago, but I don't know. I just haven't met that many people that, that come out of there. Uh, been, yeah, I've talked with way more people from from Columbia. Mm-hmm. Um, you did you did a master's in philosophy when you were at Columbia too, right? Well, it's more of a kind of a um, a door like a prize. So you get you finish your first year and you submit your master's thesis, and if that goes well, you get your MA in history. And then in two years after that, you you spend you take continue to take courses. Um, and, and also begin reading just mountains and mountains of books to get ready for your oral exams. And so at the end of your third year, if you pass your oral exams, you get a master's in philosophy. It, it's so it is completely and utterly disconnected to the f- field of philosophy. I think it's kind of an old school thing that has probably been done forever at, at older universities like Columbia, but um, it's basically just like a double masters. Um, it doesn't get, it doesn't get you a boost in pay or a a, a front row seat at uh, at a Broadway show or anything. But it's just sort of the, I mean, I've always thought of it as like keeping you going. Like you end your third yeah. year and you've you, you still haven't even started your dissertation yet. So right, it's like, right. Here's this extra piece piece of paper. Uh, now go go choose your dissertation, defend your proposal, and then write the thing, and then defend the thing. So, um, well, and I don't know if this is part of it too you're like if you don't finish your dissertation i guess you have something to show for passing your comps and yeah that that probably now that i think of it, that's probably there is maybe a practical you know credentialing thing there where they want to give credit where it's due yeah because I, I don't know what the stats are but i mean you know there are plenty of people who pass their comps and they don't finish the dissertation it might even be majority i, I don't know i think that was i don't know yeah. if that was where i went but there were certainly people that happened that happened to them yeah, see, I I got to grad school in '88 when they were still accepting a pretty good number of us, and then a I would say, I, mean, I don't know if there were 18 of us or something like that. It's a pretty big number, and then five or six were uh, just there for the masters, so they were in the you know program, but they were gonna they were gonna be done after the first year, and uh, Columbia eliminated the what they called the terminal master's degree um, as a, as an option, and they also shrunk as did all the big you know Ivy League programs. Um, led by Princeton, I think, um, they all really began accepting a much, much smaller number of students and tried to fully fund them so that, you know, you'd have fewer people, almost everybody fully funded. So that would increase the, you know, it would shrink the, the length of time you spent in graduate school and increase the numbers uh, that graduated. So I don't know what the, you know, the numbers are, but certainly, I mean, all across the board, the numbers are not good in the sense that um, it's, quite difficult to get into a graduate school program now. And then there's no guarantee that if you do everything uh, that you will get a tenure track job uh, somewhere, it's just, it's pretty bleak. Yeah. That's probably a good approach to take, like lessening the numbers, giving them the funding, at least did they stop the terminal masters. So you would have to get a PhD, but they would give you masters like you're after a couple of years. Is that? Yeah, what? you could, you could um, <laughs> on your own terms, terminal terminate your, your, you know, your time, you, you would have to get into the PhD program and then leave after a year. And you would, you know, if you did everything according to plan, you would definitely have gotten your master's. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I talked to Foner, he's, he seemed pretty, 
conservative about like letting people in their PhD programs at this point because there's there's no jobs. I mean, yeah. it's 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 awful. Um, it is, and and I you know years ago, even back in the late '90s when I was you know my first teaching gig, and then over the last couple of decades, we're at the college where I am now. You know, if a young student said, "I really want to go to graduate school and you know become a college professor," early on, I would say, "Let's do it." You know, let's you know, and here's what you need to know, and here's how it happened. If a student comes into me now and says they want to do it, I say, "Awesome, great, but here's what you really, really, really need to know." Because, um, yeah. you know, you you the the job market is pretty pretty bleak, and you might be able to get into a a very good program, but not with a lot of funding, and you know four, five, six, seven, eight years down the road, you might have a PhD, but um, you'll be in pretty big debt and you, you know, your chances of getting that decent tenure track job are, are pretty small. So it's uh, like a lot of things um, in our current times, it's, you know, um, an, a, a career track that has been whittled, whittled away, both on yeah. the private side and the, and the public side. And I mean, I think at this point, like we all know people with just horrendous student loan debt um, are, are, what kind of conversations do you have with your students? I know their bachelors, it's a little different, but I mean, a lot of people are getting huge debt, just getting their, their bachelors, let alone their PhD. Like, do you have students that come up to you that are concerned or you kind of take some time in class? Like, uh, how are you addressing it? Well, at my school, it, you know, I think our school at Holy Cross, we are a very, strong school and we're very very lucky in the sense that we are you know we're not in the same league as an ivy league school and they were like amherst and some of these schools that have billions of dollars in their endowment but we we do have a an endowment that is just right at about a billion dollars so we and a very very loyal alumni so long long and the short of it, we are very well funded we're not you know drowning in resources but we're yeah. we're doing quite well and we also i think part of the jesuit catholic identity ethos is that we pour a lot into uh, financial aid. So okay. our, our students, I wouldn't say it, it would be incorrect to say that there are not students that are struggling to, or questioning whether they can stay, but it's a, it's a smaller percentage than at, um, than at most places. So we really go, go the extra mile, I think, to make sure that everybody who gets accepted and wants to come uh, is able to do so. That's not a you know hundred percent, but that's, uh, that is the, um, the commitment of the school. Well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I didn't never th really thought of it that way. Like, you know, priests know poverty. So yeah, <laughs> the vow yeah of poverty. I, <laughs> but you don't right. want to have to do that necessarily. Some people, yeah, are. And I think, you know, the social justice ethos at a Jesuit school is pretty strong. So, yeah. um, you know, you, you realize you're, you know, you're being pretty hypocritical. Um, if, if you are simply catering to the richest people in the country and, sending all of them off to, you know, law school and, and wall street, you know, the, we, we are, um, you know, pretty committed to taking in a pretty large number of first generation students, you know, students that would not come with, uh, as fully funded or, or be able, you know, to pay most of their way. And that's just part of the, you know, part of the mission, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. Um, no, your dissertation, was that on Henry George? You right, so Henry George and the and the labor movement um, in the in the Gilded Age, really focusing on primarily on the on the eighteen eighties. Um, yeah, so that was life gets you know complicated. So that was you know my dissertation. Most people's dissertation is their first book, but Henry George, for reasons that I I will just say, life, both positive things in life and also trying and difficult things in life, meant that um, Henry George became my fourth book. Um, yeah. So uh, that was a kind of a strange <laughs> timeline, but it's a no, much better book because I'm older and wiser. And of course, unfortunately, um, had I published it way back when, a book about the Gilded Age wouldn't have, you know, made people's ears perk up. But now, because we the phrase "Second Gilded Age" or "New Gilded Age" is so in the parlance now, and so many you know people are invoking this way of understanding the problems we face today with inequality and corporate power and money in politics. Um, a book on the Gilded Age, immediately people say, are we in a second Gilded Age? So um, yeah. I really wish I had been able to put it out when I intended to, but in a, in a, its own funny way, it, it's turned out fine. Yeah, it's interesting. Look at your publications. You, you've sort of done things in reverse. Like you said, like your dissertation, you just you, you did in 2015 as a book, but you, you kind of did these more like uh, 
well, I don't want to, I don't know, sir, you did a textbook, but you also did a thousand and one things everyone should know about Irish American history. Right. That was, um, how did you, how did you get that? We probably? call that a bill payer, right? So sure. that book, um, I had had an idea for a book. I can't remember where it came from, but I, um, I remember thinking, I guess, I think I saw a book called the Jewish book of why. And I saw it at, at like a book exhibit at a you know, history conference. And I, I was really taken with it because it's literally just like, it, it's not a thousand and one things everyone should know about being Jewish, but it, that's essentially what it was. Like, why is blue a Jewish, why is blue a Jewish color? Why, what is Rosh Hashanah? What is, you know, the Torah, you know, just an and, and also what are the, who are the most famous, you know, Jewish people in history. And so I thought, wow, that, that the Irish American equivalent of that would be very cool. You know, just all the, everything from what's Murphy's law to, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy. And so I had toyed with the idea of doing a book like that, aimed at the public, a book that would earn me some money, given our <laughs> our, our dire straits financially. And um, I walked into another book exhibit, probably a year later, and there's a book said, that says, a, a series of books with the title Thousand and One Things. So Thousand and One Things Everyone Should Know About African American History, Thousand and One Things Everyone Should Know About the Civil War, Thousand and One Things Everyone Should Know About the Universe. And so I literally turned around, went out into the hallway and back in the day, uh, went to a payphone and called the guy who would be my agent if I ever did get a book together. Um, and he said, oh yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. I can, I can, I'll contact the publisher. And um, within just a few months, we had a, a book deal. How did you get an agent? Well, I was in New York, so I'm surrounded by, you know, by, by lots and lots of people. And I, you know, I had a lot of friends who were, uh, writers who weren't necessarily scholar, you know, not, not exactly. academics. And, um, and also this is the mid nineties where, um, everything Irish suddenly is super cool and super in, and there's, you, you know, everybody's yeah. listening to the chieftains and reading Frank McCourt and going to river dance and, right. um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot, of, a lot of these guys were Irish American, uh, writers. And I went to one of the, one of their, um, book signings, uh, and he introduced me, he said, Oh, you gotta meet my agent, you know, and, and, so we, we exchanged phone numbers and stayed in touch. Um, and then that, you know, to proved to be a really great contact to be able to get that, um, to get that contract and then get that book done. And then, um, on to the next one, which is a, the, the book about the general Slocum disaster. Yeah. Well, they just saw your name, Ed O'Donnell. All right. All right. Well, you know, he obviously. <laughs> you mean for the Irish one? Yeah. Write like this book. Yeah. yeah. All right. I, I had the, uh, I might've had to take a pen name if I didn't have a, as explicitly an Irish name. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well that, that certainly is to your advantage. Did that come out around the time the book uh, it was, I think it was called like how the Irish saved civilization or whatever that book was. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's riding that wave. Yeah. So in the nineties, K Thomas Cahill's book, how the Irish saved civilization was on the bestseller list for over two years. Frank McCourt's book, Angela's ashes was on the bestseller list for, I think, when the hard when the paperback came out, the hardcover was still like number two on the bestseller list. Um, and then you know, Riverdance, Riverdance becomes the you know the most popular musical entertainment uh, in in the world. The VHS cassette is the best selling video ever, uh, at least up till up till say two thousand. So I I was kind of riding that wave of deep deep interest in things Irish. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um... And, and so Henry George, you, you wanted to stick with that. I mean, you know, you already had some books like you, but you, was it kind of a, a pride thing partly to get the dissertation finished or did you just said, I, I just, I'm still interested in this. I want to get this published. Oh, I, I was absolutely keen to get it published. Yeah. Um, yeah. I felt that, you know, I, I needed it to, um, to publish it, to legitimize my, <laughs> my existence as a scholar. Um, you know, and I published scholarly articles. I'd done a bunch of other things that were clearly more on the scholarly side than the, than the public side or the, you know, the popular side, but it was really, um, you know, and I, I could have just blown it off and just never, never gotten around to it, but I just, I don't know, I'm not that kind of person. So, yeah. um, I got a, I don't know, I got a sabbatical in, I can't remember the order of things, but there were two times where um, I said to my wife, I know this sounds crazy, but I need to rent a hotel room in some remote place, uh, for a week. And I'm going to bring all my boxes and all my papers. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, it's like pulling apart an automobile. Um, and I'm going to figure out where I am, what I need to do, you know, how, what I can cut. 
and I did, I went, I, you know, this is in the dead of winter. So I went out to Northampton, you know, so it's, which is a fantastic place, but it's oh, yeah. absolutely yeah. sleepy, um, you know, like a Fairfield. And it was just a random choice. I just said, why don't, why not North, you know, and uh, you know, the hotels are like 60 bucks a night. And I just, it was like, and if you remember the movie a long time ago, but the paper chase, Oh yeah. You know, they barricade themselves in a, in a room to, to study for the law exams. And uh, I was, you know, I worked like 14 hours a day. Uh, papers everywhere, sorting, making piles. And then at like nine o'clock, I'd run out and grab a burger and a beer and then, you know, get to bed. And, and it was great. And then it, I I did it a second time once the uh, Columbia University Press said, yep, it's everything looks great. Um, however, you're way over the word count. And so <laughs> I had turned it in at exactly the word count. And they said, oh, the word count also includes footnotes. I was like, oh, so I had to finally, I had to drop everything and cut 30,000 words. So, um, I went, I went back out to Northampton, rented the, the same, you know, the same rooms like a two years later. And, uh, that's what helped push it over the finish line. You should have endowed the room as like the Ed O'Donnell, like <laughs> finishing manuscript room or something. Yeah. I, it, uh, it was a, it was a, a weird thing to do, but it, you know, given my own knowledge of my own ways of working and my own ADD, uh, you know, distractibility, et cetera. Um, there's something I tell my students this all the time. I say, no, this is not true for all of you, but for many of you, the most overlooked part of academic success is geography. And they look at you like, what? And I say, geography, if you study in your room, you're not going to do well. Your room is a terrible piece of geography to try, try to get work done in, um, trying to get work done in, you know, the main, the, in the main library during, you know, midterms and finals is a terrible place to, you know, find a, find the quiet spots, um, and the isolated spots, uh, on campus and off campus. And that's where you're really going to be able to kind of get a legit amount of whether it's reading or writing or working on, you know, economics problem sets. Yeah. Well, and I mean, 20 years between dissertation and getting the book published on Henry George with other books <laughs> that you've written in that time period, that's pretty productive. I mean, I, I mean, as you know, like you, you do 10 books on a, you can do 10 years on a book easy. Easily. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you've reached this point. I, I kind of feel like I have where like, I don't need to do any more research. Like I just, I need to, like you did find the time to write. Um, even if it's a 20 year old project, it's still been kicking around in your head for years and years. And you, I mean, I know I love doing archival research, but I'm like, I have boxes in my closet of mm -hmm. like two books, three books potentially. And I'm like, I just need to find the time to write. I don't, I don't think I'd ever need to do a lot of research and ever again. I mean, like you said, like you need to follow up on these things and uh, right. And more stuff becomes, you know, in this era, more stuff becomes available, you know, so right. in the time that's passed, suddenly, you know, with a few clicks, you're able to read way more letters uh, from this particular, you know, or read more, far more magazines or newspapers, you know, from that era uh, that focus on that topic. So there is yeah. that, <laughs> that blessing and that curse of expanding, uh, access to resources. Um, yeah, but I, I agree. And I think, you know, at this point, you know, right now I'm, I'm starting a book, uh, on it's a series for Johns Hopkins and it's on kind of pivotal events in American history. So I think it's called witness to history and it's, you know, the Salem witch trials and okay. assassination of Lincoln and all. And so the one I I've not got it contracted, but the one I'm, they, they are very interested in it at, at least is a, uh, 200 page book, um, on the uh, Pullman strike of 1894. And so it's got all the elements of a great story, but it's not, you know, the beauty of it is that it's a, uh, it's not a research book. It's a book where they want you to take what's at, what's done, synthesize it and make it a really well-written book that a, that a undergrad would, would read in a labor history course or a course on the, on the Gilded Age. Yeah. Now, I, have you always been a pretty focused guy? I mean, and I know a lot of people, they, again, they didn't have a family when they were in grad school or start or whatever. Like, did that help you kind of buckle down, you think? Or have you always kind of been that way? Like, uh, how <laughs> have things changed for you? Or have you always been pretty? It sounds like you're pretty focused. Yeah, I am pretty focused. I, I, I think I need my children, who are now in their 20s and 30s, um, tell me that I, you know, that when I'm heading into sabbatical, they will tell me straight up, they say, are you going to? you know, practice relaxing, <laughs> practice goofing off, um, you know, and I say, I'm trying, I'm trying, you know, and it's, and I do goof off in the sense that I will spend four hours digging in the garden, right? So it's, 
but it's also it's always something productive, <laughs> even if it's not professionally pr- productive. So yeah. I'm uh, I'm I'm working on that. But I I guess I have always been pretty goal oriented and pretty driven. Um, you know, there is about seven steps to becoming a college professor, right? So you know, getting into graduate school, finishing your master's, passing your orals, defending your dissertation proposal, writing and defending your dissertation getting a job and then getting tenure. I don't know if that's seven, but it's about seven or eight um, things. And each one I took, you know, one in, you know, in turn to figure out how to, how to make that, um, how to make that happen. And, you know, I've been blessed along the way. I've had lots of, lots of good luck. I've had lots of, you know, incredibly helpful people. So I w- when I say that I'm driven in focus, I'm, I'm averse to saying, um, to making it a Horatio Alger or a hyper individualist story. Um, I'm, I'm deeply aware of all the, the, the role that good luck and that, uh, helpful people have played along the way. Yeah. Um, are you, you're, you've always been a morning guy. I think, yeah, I would say I'm definitely a morning guy, but you know, I'm 58 now, so I need a little more sleep than I used to. I used to be a six hours person. Now I'm okay. pretty committed to, uh, something closer to eight, but, um, yeah, so I'm on sabbatical and, uh, we, we are empty nesters. And so I could, I could sleep in till, you know, seven, eight o'clock, um, all summer and then all into the fall. But I'm, I'm pretty committed to getting, getting up, uh, at six. Now we do have the NBA playoffs coming up, so there will be quite a, no- there'll be at least four mornings where I will not be getting up at five thirty or six to go running. Um, because the, the, the uh, championship, uh, the NBA games are starting at 9 PM. So, I mean, that means at the minimum 1130, 1130, uh, lights out. But I, yeah, I, I, um, I'm, I get up pretty, you know, six o'clock, six ish, um, pretty much every day. I'm going to try to be more of a five thirty person. Um, but I get up and I go and I, you know, I, I do some form of hard exercise. So I either run five miles or I, uh, come or I, you know, because I can't run on my, my I'm incredibly lucky. You talk about lucky. My, I'm 58 and my knees are still in great shape. I, you know, I probably have one, at least one more marathon left in me, maybe Boston this, uh, in the spring okay. of 23. But, uh, so I, I do, you know, some, uh, intense form of, you know, exercise running or the elliptical or cycling, um, and then, you know, get down, get down to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think you'll have the book done by the end of your sabbatical or? You yeah, I think I, I might even have it done by, you know, I, I, this is the other, the other one, one way to be productive is to set ridiculous goals. And then you realize you're not going to make it, but because you, because it was a ridiculous goal, you start the project. Yeah. Same thing is true when it comes to like painting a bedroom or something in your house, you go, well, I could, I could probably do this. And if I, you know, get up early on Saturday, I could be done by five o'clock and you realize, no, it's actually a three day process. And, <laughs> but yeah. you got it started because you kidded yourself that you could get it done by, you know, by the end of the day. Yeah. And so, um, this book is, it's a, it's a template. So it's a five chapter format. 75,000 words max, um, minimal footnotes. So, and I've already done a ton of work on it, you know, so I've got, and I've got one chapter already written, which is the, the, the sample chapter. So that's 60,000 words to write, you know, over the summer into the fall. So I think I, I could realistically um, finish it, let's say by Thanksgiving. I mean, there may be more follow up. There may be more other things uh, along with it. I've got a, a scholarly article that I've been working on forever, um, <laughs> kind of not quite as long as Henry George. That I really want to just kind of buckle down and get that uh, finished, and then probably towards the end of sabbatical, start a new book that would be aimed at a much, you know, more like the General Slocum book, more a book that has uh, kind of an exciting drama to it that's aimed at the mass market, um, that's got really com- you know compelling characters and and all. So I have a couple of ideas for that, but I'm, I'm keeping them close to my chest. Okay. So you'll be back teaching in January. No, no, I, I, you can have a half sabbatical, uh, or a full year sabbatical. So this is, you know, kind of a magical thing. It's actually a 16 month break because it's summer academic year, summer. So, um, I won't, I will not be stepping into a classroom until September of 23. Okay. Wow. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's, um, it's an amazing uh, benefit, you know, great. Yeah. Thing well, my me. dissertation advisor, he took a sabbatical while I was working on my dissertation. So there was like 18 months. I didn't see him mm-hmm. in California. 
Yeah. Yeah, I know it, it can be. It's much less dramatic at the undergrad level where yeah. the student says, oh, I wanted you to be my senior thesis advisor. And, you know, you can sometimes even agree to be like the second reader, but you're um, for grad school. It's a lot. It's a much bigger or I guess the worst thing in grad school is if your advisor gets gets a better job somewhere and just up and leaves. Yeah, I, I didn't have that problem, although my advisor had a stroke in mm. my last semester. So I had to have a different head. Of, I mean, it's just a nightmare. Oof. But um got through it but uh but yeah he didn't use the computer so like there's no email exchanges he typed up his notes on a typewriter wow <laughs> old school oh yes yeah um no i i know we didn't really talk about the podcast um i know i've had you about an hour we, we don't need to talk about it that long but um if you could just talk a little bit about in the past lane because you're doing that for a while seemed like um you, you, i don't know would you do about 200 episodes yeah i did uh, officially 199 i meant to do a 200th but i just was out of gas um it's almost yeah. more memorable 199 you went away and you just yeah <laughs> yeah maybe there is some so something it's a yeah i i like round numbers but i, I also do kind of like that um waiting for the last drum beat you know or that will never come um, yeah uh, number yeah so i started it you know uh, it's obvious now uh, listen to what we've been talking about that i've always had a public history side to me Always, you know, whether it's walking tours, giving you know lectures, uh, getting on NPR, getting on PBS. Um, I just did the. I was a um, featured historian in the two-part uh, Theodore Roosevelt documentary that aired on yeah. uh, his, History Channel uh, Monday night and, and Tuesday night, and so I've always had that kind of public-facing uh, side to me. And so the, and I've also always loved radio and loved NPR. So. When podcasting became a thing, I set my sights on it. And so when I had a sabbatical back in 2015, um, I said, I'm going to start start my podcast. And I had been thinking about it for a really long time. So I knew exactly what I wanted it to, to be like and to sound like. And it was great. It was a you know, massive learning curve. I had to learn it like you. You know, you learn everything yourself. <laughs> yeah. and the technology keeps getting better, but also more complicated. Um, and it was great. I realized I turned out, you know, if I can say modestly that I feel like I was a pretty gar you know, pretty good interviewer and to be a historian interviewing another historian gives you kind of a, you can ask questions that are different, even from the most intelligent NPR reporter, you know, asking, doing an interview. Right. So that was, and I would get a lot of feedback from people like saying, wow, this is the most interesting interview I've ever done <laughs> you know, because I was just able to ask not just sort of, you know, questions one through 10, but respond to what they were talking about. And then, you know, or to interject something from my own my own experience. And so yeah. that was, it was just a ton of fun. And the, the problem was, it was just too time consuming for me. And I realized at one point, if I ever want to write books, I can podcast or I can go back to writing books. So, you know, I, I finished my Henry George book, started a podcast. And then I also became chair of my department. Um, there's also, and then also the pandemic. So there were a lot of things that left me pretty kind of, uh, kind of spent as far as uh, the podcast. Although I do have to say every time I see you know, um, a new book, uh, on the horizon, my, I have this physical reaction, like, Oh, I've got to contact that person, you know, to, to interview right. them. You know? So, uh, unfortunately <laughs> yeah. when you're, when you're, uh, when you're, when your next, uh, book, um, country boy, is that, that doesn't come out yet, right? It's impending. July. Yeah. July. Yeah. So. yeah you know, that would be a book, um, that most certainly I, I would be uh, shooting you an email or a DM saying, Hey, would you, are you available for, so there is that still that, that instinct. Um, I think part of the problem was I, when I look back at how much time I spent on each episode, it was, I was, I mean, to say that I was obsessive about sound quality, I would spend hours and hours, you know, I get a 45 minute interview and then I would spend six hours, eight hours, like scrubbing it, getting it clean and, you know, taking out every little breath sound and all. And, uh, I now, you know, listening to way more, more podcasts and I'm realizing there are a lot of people that just, you know, record the interview they just say hey it's me and here with me here today there's no intro there's no music there's nothing and it's, yeah. and it's it's just the you know the interview itself is really well done and really interesting and you know people sneeze and people you know knock over their microphone and you know they, the guy doesn't cut anything and yeah. i thought wow if i had just done it you know re record it slap an intro you know maybe a, do a few things but it doesn't have to sound npr quality um, I might still be podcasting, but of course, the other part of my brain realizes that I would not be writing books. So I think I'm going to take the in the past lane experience of four plus years as an amazing experience where I learned a ton 
It also allowed me to help, you know, have students of my own now make podcast episodes because I'm pretty versed, well versed in the technology. So there, it was a great chapter, but I think it's time to time to get get on to my first love, which is writing books. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. Um, no, I mean, it's hard. I mean, obviously, you have a full time job. You have family. I know you said your kids are, are out, but like, yeah, with COVID, I mean, I don't know if this is your experience, but like sometimes they just start stacking up. And it's like, I have five podcasts I have to edit that are like an hour and an hour and a half each. Yeah. Like, I, I just don't want to even deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just so many things clamoring for, for uh, one's, uh, yeah. one's attention. And then you do, like, then I would be in that situation myself. And then I'd say, okay, fine. I'm going to drop everything. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm going to make this episode. And that's great. And Friday night, you drop the episode or whatever, you know, whenever you drop the episode. And then you you look, you look you, you sort of pull back and realize, Oh, I have 65 papers to grade. Um, the lawn isn't mowed. The, you know, like nine, nine things now loom, you know, uh, as payback for having devoted the time to the, <laughs> to the podcast. Yeah, so. I, last summer the, yeah, they were stacking up and I, and it was just, it was just so rough last year. Mm. I was like, I got to start scaling this back. Um, so I've tried to get it to more like a one-to-one ratio if I can. Yeah. I'm like not obsess over every pause and, fuzz and on all that crap but um like did you was it ge- generating any revenue for you like did you well, get to I, that point? yeah i got to the point so just as i was starting to like get exhausted and and also my my becoming chair of my department and all of that just as that was happening i was hitting the you know the magic 1500 1800 2000 downloads per episode which yeah. is right, you know, the, the metrics may have changed, uh, but that was the sweet spot. That's where you could literally reach out to uh, advertisers or join, you know, some sort of collective. Um, and and I actually got people contacting me saying, you know, would you would you consider having advertising? And that might have turned the corner for me because my goal, my my major goal would, was to bring in enough ad revenue to be able to record my episode and hand it off to somebody and they magically turn it into an episode. So all of my work would have been to read the book, to prep, to do the interview and then to walk away, yeah. you know, so that I didn't have to do any mixing, any editing, you know, right. it would all just magically happen. And I know that people, you know, there are people that got to that uh, stage and I might, you know, if I'd kept at it, I might've turned that corner. Um, but then again, you know, that, and it would have been it would have been great, um, but uh, it would have also probably even then still kept me from getting back into uh, the archives and, and doing some writing. Yeah, it's it's hard to do everything, but I I do know some people. Yeah, that uh, were able to get a a network deal essentially. So like Professor Buzzkill, he records it, and they they the wizards take care of it. Um, and I know there's some issues with that in terms of someone else taking over your work, but like, yeah. I, and when you're doing it all yourself and it sounds like you were, I mean, it is, it's incredibly time consuming. And some people, they try to do like one a week. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's another thing, you know, the other model that I considered, but it just, like, again, I don't think I had enough time to think, but another model is going to a seasonal model. And so just do 10 episodes and then take two months off and then do, you know, you could do one season a year. You could do, you know, periodic, you know, why not do, you know, three, eight episode seasons that even and you're going to maybe have a theme to them, right? So it's, um, you know, the, uh, 10 episodes, eight episodes in and around the uh, Civil War era um, with, you know, again, interviewing historians about their books. But because um, that seemed to be a lot of quite a number of people have sort of moved in that in that direction, if not officially. And that seems much more much more sane, but that that's what I've heard you should do is do it as a season kind of, but then I'm like, well, that's still pretty consistent. Like you're on kind of a schedule. Um, yeah. Cause I know some people who have, who are, who have really good, uh, downloads and stuff. And there's still maybe every couple months sometimes, you know, it's just whenever they can do it or like one week they'll drop five and then it'll be like five months for another. <laughs> it's just like yeah. totally inconsistent. Yeah. And I it's, understand all that. I mean, if it's, you know, it's, you have a day job, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and not to necessarily uh, just real quick, like choose. I, I don't. You don't necessarily have to answer this, but like, were there some that were your favorites? Like certain people that you remember talking to that were like really memorable for you? I mean, I know he had Ken Burns on. Yeah, though. Ken Burns was definitely memorable. Partly also because of, I think the topic Vietnam is just such a 
yeah, um, a powerful, a powerful topic. Um, let's see. Did you reach uh, out to him or how did that yeah, work? Well, I had a connection, so he would okay. never have done it. Um, so one of my students, uh, one of my undergrads went and worked for him for a year. Okay. And so I was able to say, Hey, is there any way you could, you know, put me in touch with Ken Burns assistant? Um, and then he did it and he was as gracious and, and, you know, um, gave me all the time I needed. And, you know, I, and it was also very clear he was, you know, talking to me because he's a wind up and go kind of a guy, you know, he does yeah. so many interviews. Right. And, um, there were a couple of qu- qu- uh, several mo- moments in that interview where I think I asked him a question where he, where he, he could, he, he, at one point he goes, yeah, you know, I never really thought about that. There's something to that effect where it was very, he was very generous with his time and with his, you know, attention uh, yeah. as well. Um, yeah, I'm going to draw a complete blank on all these. I mean, there <laughs> are, there's so many, um, yeah, yeah. so many that I, uh, that I really enjoyed. I mean, one of my, one of the episodes that people still ask me about or still say is one of my first episodes. It's top, I think it's number, number nine, which is on the history of ice in America. And so I've always had these, you know, everybody at some point, you know, acquires a certain random piece of knowledge. And so I remember learning about the ice industry in Massachusetts and this guy named Frederick Tudor, who kind of invented commercialized ice harvesting. And it's a fascinating story. Um, then it turns out I, I met a historian who's, you know, a Jonathan Reese, who's a, an expert on the history of refrigeration slash ice. And so I interviewed the first part of the episode. It's like my it's, it's still very much in that NPR, um, you know, style where the first uh, feature is me doing the story of Frederick, Frederick Tudor. And the, you know, becoming the ice king. The next is then I talked to Jonathan about, you know, the, the rest of the story, the advent of commercial refrigeration. And then I happened to be in New York uh, right around that time. And I was at a hotel where there's this, these bars, they're, they're apparently it's a chain, but it's, I think it's called Minus Five. Or five yeah, below. I know what you and mean. It's, like a, it's basically like a walk-in freezer and it's blocks of ice. It's really cold. And you, you know, you, you get a really, really cold drink and I don't know what else. Anyway, so I talked, I chatted with the guy who was running it and he was very funny and very um, good. So it was a, you know, three part episode. It had all the things and, uh, you know, lots of variety. And yeah, that's one that quite a number of people um, tell me that they, uh, that they really enjoyed. Okay. Well, speaking of the paper chase, I had uh, John J. Osborne, who wrote the book on my podcast a while. Oh, really? He, that was a lot of fun because I don't usually do those kinds of talks. But yeah, he was very generous with his time. He, he was telling me anecdotes about uh, uh, Professor King's John Hausman and stuff. It was really, really cool. Yeah. Um, how, now I wonder, I'm thinking like how old? Um, He's not that old because I think he he published the book. He was like twenty five or something. Yeah, because I think it was happening because I think of it as a late sixties movie, isn't it? Or I, pretty, it, it's pretty much. It, I think it's like seventy three, but it, it does have like a late sixties feel to it. But no, I mean, I think he, I don't know if he was still in school when he published it or something. But it's something like that. It was like mm. phenomenal success with that, and it was a TV show too. So. He kind of rode that way for a while, um, but uh, you know, I I love that movie. I mean, I know it's about law school, but like that is grad school for me. Mm-hmm. That yeah. hits it better than anything else. Um, and oddly, the other great grad school movie for me is High Fidelity, which has nothing to do with grad school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but still, a still a spectacular <laughs> like a movie that just is if you if you. I often describe movies like that as if you go into a hotel and you turn on the TV and it's midway in that movie, that and like Forrest Gump or something, you just sit down and watch the rest of it. Like you, yeah, you, you, yeah. Know, you don't, yeah. you don't skip past. So, yeah. Um, all right. Well, Ed, it was, it was fun to pick your brain for, I'm sorry it took me so long to do this. Um, but, uh, congrats on your sabbatical and, and good luck, the, good luck with the book. Although it sounds like you got it pretty under control. So, well, f- for you. Book, book number one and then, uh, article and then, uh, what, what the next uh, the, what the next big blockbuster will or, or well I don't really have a blockbuster I have a semi blockbuster but um, but the one that might might reach a, a big audience we'll see what that how that comes okay. together cool all right yeah well good luck and uh, go Celtics <laughs> all right yeah thank you. hope so they're they're in the they're in the dance that's all I we think can ask it might be the Cinderella story this year I don't know um, it, it, you know it sounds like the Warriors are good but. They're, the Celts are kind of scrappy, so 
think they're also the Celtics are a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde team. Sort of depends, as they say, which team shows up. So when they're on, they're they're pretty pretty tough to beat. But they will often follow a game where they're dominant with a game where they look like they've all you know had a lot of cough syrup before the game started. So well, that's been the Red Sox this year. Yeah. like unbeatable one minute and pathetic. And lose lose three out of five to the Orioles. Oh God. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, might be for a frustrating year, but last year was kind of frustrating too, even though they mm. had a good year statistically, but game to game, I was like, mm. yeah. So. All right. Well, thanks again, Ed. And right. uh, I'll be in touch. Take care. All right. Thank, thank you. All right. That was my talk with Ed O'Donnell. I hope you enjoyed that. You can check out his books, Going back to 1001 Things Everyone Should Know About Irish American History. His most recent one is Henry George and the Crisis of Inequality. But he's also the author of Visions of America, A History of the United States, and Ship Ablaze, The Tragedy of the Steamboat General Slocum. Ed is continuing to be productive, working on a couple projects. So I hope those go well, and I hope everything goes well when when he gets back to holy cross to teach nice talking with ed you can check out my books marching masters slavery race in the confederate army during the civil war available through university of virginia press pretty much same price as last time 39.95 hardcover and 29.95 for the kindle and you can pre-order my new book johnny cash sorry you can pre-order my new book country boy the roots of johnny cash 24.95 24.95 paperback. You can get that on Amazon right now, and that'll be free delivery. And eventually, there's going to be an audiobook, so you can get that if you want, rather than read it, or you can get the book and read it, and then get the audiobook, or some combination of the two. I don't care. Give one of, give one as a gift. Give both as a gift. But uh, July 29 is still the day, so that'll be exciting. All right. I will be talking with you soon. Take care. Bye. Stay cool.